If you want to have wisdom in life, and you want to have a good life, you're going to have to understand how to deal with fools. Life will be better if we avoid foolish entanglements. And please avoid having help a fool day in your life. <laughs> it seems as though many Christians feel the necessity to help a fool. They ought to have a t-shirt that says National Help a Fool Day. Because like Mr. T, only we go a little too far, we pity the fool. And then we try to help the fool. And you can't always help the fool. And the bottom line is, is we need to know what the Word says about our interaction with fools. Because the Word has a lot to say about it. And it actually says that a whole lot of your life is going to be dictated by how you interact with fools. Again, read Proverbs. So, first thing we got to do is identify the fools. So when it comes to identifying the fools, we, there's some things we need to know. First, we have all played the fool at some point. Look at your neighbor and tell them, say, yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, we all have. So l let's not be too hard on the fool. Because we've been there. Hopefully, and this brings us to the next thing, hopefully we've only been the first category of fools. There's three categories of fools. The first one is momentary fools. And I really like to use the phrase that I think is the uh, most common uh, last words among many rednecks who die early. <laughs> Watch this! <laughs> and then there's a problem. A lot of times, we've all at least been the momentary fool. We've done that dumb thing. We've done that stupid thing that we look back and go, man, I should have never done that. <laughs> and thank God when it hasn't cost us too much. But when you're even a momentary fool, it can be very costly. Being a momentary fool can even cause a person their life. It's happened. The second type of fool, or second category of fool, is what I like to call a seasonal flu, fool, not flu, but a seasonal fool. Because they're not a fool for a moment, they're a fool for a protracted period. And usually there's some kind of dynamic playing. One of the most common dynamics that are playing for a seasonal fool is it's either a guy or a girl. <laughs> now that's not the only thing that can cause somebody to be a seasonal fool. But it is a common one. Oh, uh, No names. And you don't have to respond. But how many times has somebody gotten involved with a seasonal fool and came out hurting because of it? Yes, amen. And then the third category of fool, you definitely want to avoid this one, is what I call the lifers. They are fool for life. I, I mean, there is no end. Because see, when it comes to this, you can recover from being a fool. Particularly momentary, you can recover. Seasonal, you can still recover. But there's a greater likelihood you're going to suffer. If you're a seasonal fool. Lifers, dear God, help them. But you see, with this, uh, on any of those kind of fools, it's not like COVID, 
where you can isolate for 14 days. <laughs> you need to avoid the fool as long as they got symptoms. <laughs> if they're showing symptoms, stay away from the fool. Now, what are some of the symptoms? Well, let me give you a verse first. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. Because this tells us something. It starts helping us identify a fool. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools despise it. You see, fools, this is the effort definition, fools lack understanding on purpose. It's not that they don't have the information. They just don't like the information. They despise the information. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you want to honor God, you look for information. You try to get information. You try to be knowledgeable about things. But if you're a fool, ah, I don't need that. And knowledge is rejected. It's not that they can't have it. Not that they don't even have the information or haven't been told. But they lack it on purpose. They lack it on purpose. Now here's some of the signs or symptoms of fools. That you might be in contact with a fool. Now please don't nudge your neighbor. Number one, and these are very simple. They talk foolishly. They get talking on the inside you going, that's foolish. That's a sign. Do not ignore the signs and symptoms. They might be just a momentary fool. But you get going down that road, you can get stuck. They have foolish ideas. You know, I've been thinking about doing this, and you go, Oh, Lord, that's dumb. <laughs> they have foolish ideas. They reach... Foolish conclusions. You know, they can be talking, yeah, we're going to do this and that. And you go, well, nobody else would think that's a good idea. But they think it's wonderful. They reach foolish conclusions. And this one I personally love because it is so true. They have foolish associates. You see, fools often come in bunches like bananas. <laughs> you usually don't get one by themselves. They come in bunches. And there's always usually a lead fool. And all the other fools are falling in behind them. And you can see that group of fools coming. And it usually doesn't take long to identify who the lead fool is. You know, uh, I actually, years ago, I was at the mall uh, here in town, and Aaron was getting a haircut. And we were sitting outside there, and this guy comes walking around the corner. I just saw him, didn't pay attention. Next thing you know, I hear a bunch of people yelling. And see, um, um, I have experience with fools I have seen fools been around fools I've got a lot of history uh, that I can draw on and these guys come around it's about eight of them are yelling at this other guy challenging him to a fight it's the lead fool is and so he tells them where they're parked and he said, you come on around there. We'll settle this. And I'm sitting there going, fool, you're getting ready to listen to a fool. So they take off that way, the group of eight or nine. And the other guy goes out that way. And I look at, well, they called for Aaron. And I told him, I said, you go on in. I'll be there in a minute. So I follow the other guy out into the parking lot. Well, when I open the door, he's looking around. He's thinking they're about ready to jump him. And so, see, I am versed. In full practice. <laughs> and I told him. I stopped him. And I said, listen. I said, I heard all that. 
I said, you get in your car and you go home. No, I'm going to go around there and sell it. I said, you don't know what they got around there. I said, they got something around there. They wanted you around there. I said, you're either going to take on all of them, or they got a knife, they got a gun, they got something. I said, you get in your car, do not drive straight home. Go ride around for an hour, somewhere that you don't usually go. Stay away. See, because you get involved with fools, it will hurt you. You know, and anyway. But they do have, they do come in bunches typically. And here's the thing. Fools believe that they should be able to do what they want and it shouldn't have consequences. That's a huge symptom of a fool. They think they should be able to do whatever and everything should be okay. Everything should be fine. That's a fool. You know, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will reap. So there's always going to be something that goes along with it. One of the stories that I used, because my boys both played baseball, they played a number of sports, but the easiest one to use was baseball. And sometimes I would pick up a bat, and I'd say, you hold this bat by this end. I said, but here's the thing. Just like in life, I said, every time you swing this end, that other end is out there doing something. And it goes based on where you do this end. I said, and in life, you can do this and say, well, I never meant to break that. I said, you, if you forget that there are possible consequences out here, you're going to break stuff. You're going to have problems. You've got to understand that there's two ends to this bat. There's the end that is your action that you can control, but once you do it, that other end is moving, and it's out there further, and it will have consequences. And you've got to understand, there always is something that goes along with our actions. Can you say amen? amen. I know that's jumping up and down preaching type stuff, but uh, it, it's true for life. Now, let's look at something Jesus said. Now, he didn't use the word fool, but it's kind of implied. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, let's look at that. Um. Uh, because here, Jesus tells a story, and the thing of it is, is a lot of good Christians violate what Jesus said here. And then they don't understand why what Jesus said happens to them. <laughs> he said, if you do this, this is going to happen. Then they do this because of the goodness and kindness of their heart. And to use a southern expression, bless your heart. But if you do this, you're probably going to get this because that's what Jesus said was coming. So don't be shocked. Matthew chapter 7 verse 6. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Oh, isn't that wonderful? No, Jesus said, if you give to the pigs what is valuable, pearls. He said, they'll trample them under their feet, and then they'll turn and start tearing into you. And a lot of Christians, because of failure to identify fools, or failure to identify pigs, the pig is the fool, Due to failure to do that, believers have sometimes shared things with people and then were in shock and amazement that someone could belittle and treat so terribly that wonderful thing that God did in their life. And then see that same person turn and start ripping into them and start saying bad stuff about them and tearing down their faith. 
and they don't understand why because I was just trying to be a blessing and talk to them about how good God was. But that has happened. And based on what Jesus said here, when he said don't give what you value, the pearls to pigs or fools, you need to know who the pigs are. Now, this week, if you run into somebody, don't look at him and go, oh, you one of them pigs Pastor Ray's talking about. <laughs> you a fool. Yeah. Just, you act just like Pastor Ray talked about. Don't do that, please. <laughs> please don't do that. But you do need to know who the pigs are. And you should handle life accordingly. You see, there are times that you just don't share some things with certain people. Jesus, when he healed people, sometimes he told them, he said, don't go back into the city and tell them. Why? There's a bunch of pigs in there. Them people a bunch of fools. They're going to take what has happened in your life, they're going to tear it down, they're going to belittle it, and then they're going to tear into you for being just such a fool and believing what you believe. So don't give it to them. I mean, you, again, don't look at them and go, I ain't telling, I got something I'd like to tell you, but I'm not telling you because you a fool. <laughs> Walk in love. Walk in love, but identify fools and act accordingly based on what the Word says. And the Word has a lot to say, again, particularly Proverbs. Now, you see, one of the bad things is and, and, and this, this is, one to me, one of the modern signs of fools. Fools will challenge your devotion if you deal with them the way Jesus said to. So be ready. You say, what do you mean? Well, here's two commonly used phrases by fools. I thought you were supposed to be a Christian. See, a fool isn't functioning off of sound reasoning. So therefore, their only tool that they can use to impact you is manipulation and guilt. I thought you were supposed to be a Christian. I thought Christians were supposed to forgive. That's another one they like to use. Well, yeah, I did forgive you. Yeah, but you don't trust me. You, as a Christian, I thought you were supposed to trust me. Where did you read that? Because it ain't in the Bible. See, you can respect people just because they're a human being. We should treat everyone respectfully. You can give respect, but you cannot give trust. Trust is earned. Well, you know, I gave, I, you know, I, I gave trust one time. Oh, really? How did you do that? Well, this person did me wrong, and, and, and I gave them a chance. Uh, no, that, that's not giving trust. Because the whole time you were giving them a second chance, on the inside you were going, Oh, I hope this turns out okay. You had this little itching feeling down on the inside. Why? Because they had violated trust before. And so you didn't have trust on the inside. You were just praying to God that it would be okay. And you did want to give them a chance. And there's nothing wrong with giving people a chance. To use a Ronald Reagan quote, trust but verify. You know, there, there, there's things, you, you, you earn trust. That's the only way you get it. See, you can trust God in your heart because you know you can count on Him. But if you don't know you can count on somebody, you can't trust them. See, uh, Stephen Covey, uh, in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he made a statement, I might not get the quote exactly right, but he made a statement that is so good. He said the laws of human interaction are as fixed as the laws of nature. In other words, if I had a rock in my hand and let go of it, 
it's fallen to the floor. That's a fixed law of nature. Here's another fixed law. If somebody lies to you, your trust level decreases. It is a fixed law. You cannot choose, no, 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 I'm, going, I'm not going to let my trust level, no, it's going to decrease. It is a fixed law. Just like that rock went down, your trust level will go down. Oh, well, I'm just going to give them a chance. Well, you can give them a chance, but the trust level is still down, and it won't come back up until they earn it. And there's nothing you can do about that. That is a fixed law of human interaction. But fools think that shouldn't be the case. And again, they will especially try to manipulate you as a believer. Well, I thought you was a Christian. You're supposed to love everybody. Well, I do love you. Well, if you love me, then you should trust me. Who said that? Again, it's not in the book. Let me give you an example, a couple of very real examples. You know, um, if someone, and thank God, God believes in second chances for everybody. I mean, he even gives people more than two. And aren't we all glad? But the thing of it is, let's say somebody got locked up for stealing. And they come to church here. We love them and they're welcome. Thank you for that one amen. We love them and they're welcome. But if they say, well, I'd like to volunteer. I can tell you what we're not going to say. Can you help count the offering? We're not doing that. Not happening. Let me go something to a little bit more real because this did literally happen. Um, over the years, we, we've had different people that have been charged and convicted with being pedophiles. Um, and we had one that wanted to work in the children's ministry. And they actually asked the director in that particular department if they could, and they had told them no, because they knew our policy. And then they kept asking. They finally said, well, you just go talk to Pastor Ray. So they came to me, and they were asking me about working with kids. And I said, no, we can't do that. Well, I thought you forgave me. I said, well, we did. Then why won't you let me work in the children's department? Uh, they talked foolishly. They have foolish ideas. They reach foolish conclusions. All those symptoms. And I said, no. I said, we love you. And I, I hope you have never felt like we've treated you any less. I said, but no, you cannot work in the children's ministry. It's just not going to happen. You can work in a number of other places. But you can't go there. Because, see, part of this, again, fools will tend to challenge your devotion. Because it's an easy play to play on the love of God and forgiveness and how forgiving you should be. And you see, with this, um, you, the, here's the thing. You can't let the fools make the rules. See, if you let the fools make the rules, you're going to have problems. And see, at that point, yeah, we can find places. There's things that, I mean, there's things that can be done. But if you stole, you're not counting the offering. If you've molested kids, you're not working with the kids. It's just not happening has nothing to do with not forgiving. You know, and so, you see, and with this, let's talk about the flip side of it real quick. Uh, it's not on your outline, but the NIV of uh, Proverbs 4.23 says this, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. 
See, here's one of the things that you've got to be careful of. Because especially if you let fools make the rules, and then you hurt because of it, then your heart can get hardened. And you don't need to have a hardened heart. You need to guard your heart with all diligence. You need to keep your heart clear. See, any of you ever have a room you're trying to get into and there's stuff blocking the door and you can't get the door open until some way you can reach around and get everything moved? Well, in your spiritual life, very often that access to God, not in the sense of Him hearing us, but in the sense of Him being able to get to us what we need, get to us wisdom, be able to speak to us about guidance and direction. Sometimes the door is blocked by rocks of offense. We get offended and hold something against somebody in our hearts. And it blocks the door, and we don't even see it's connected. Well, why won't God give me this information? Well, look and see. See, you're trying to access information, and the door's blocked. you got to get in there. But if, if, you've, if you're holding a fence against people, then that's going to hinder. Well, that has nothing to do with me and my walk with the Lord. Uh, well, I'd encourage you to read the Bible. Amen. But... You see, that, that hinders us. And so any time that we have any interaction with people, we've got to make sure we keep our hearts clear. Doesn't mean that we have to agree with them. Doesn't mean we have to condone their conclusions. But we just got to keep our hearts clear. We got to stay in a place ourselves where we can hear God and He can give us direction and we can get the information that we need so that we can go forward. And, and see, one of the problems is sometimes the devil will send a fool your way. And the only purpose that fool has is an assignment from the devil to put a rock on your door, keeping you from being able to open it and access direction from God. So we, we, unforgiveness is one of the biggest rocks that blocks things. The book of Genesis tells us about Isaac, that he had dug, that wells had been dug by Abraham and so forth, and, and then the enemy came in and filled those wells. They filled it with junk and stuff. And see, a lot of times the devil will send a fool by your path, by you, and his only purpose from the enemy is to throw stuff in your well, clogging the source. Guard your heart. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. He just wants to clog it so that you cannot be effective for God and you can't be effective in life because your well's clogged. And you can't draw out what you need. So you've got to understand very often, fools have assignments. And their assignment is to get you irritated, to get you irate, to get you emotional. Because the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. James chapter 1. And here if you're wanting to do what God wants and this fool is tweaking you and gets you all messed up, then you can't actually do what God wants you to do. That's why we've got to guard our heart. But it doesn't mean we let them make the rules. We still don't let the fool make the rules. But we keep our heart clear in the process. And see, with that, you've got to recognize fools and avoid them to the extent you can. And, and I say to the extent you can because you might not be able to... Well, let me put it this way. You cannot avoid all fools. Some of them might be at your family reunion. And you know you're going to see that fool. Amen. Well, be nice to the fool. Just don't get entangled with the fool. Uh, avoid lengthy discussions with the fool. 
that fool might be at work. You might run into him every day at work. Do not this week go up to him and say, you know, Pastor Ray said I might, I, there's a, might be a fool in my job. It's you. Don't do that. Don't do that. But do recognize it. And now, here is my disclaimer. Because I know I have been at this long enough that people can reach all kinds of conclusions no matter what your intention is. Do not go home and tell your spouse, Pastor Ray told me to avoid the fool, so i got to stay away from you. I am not saying that. You say, but they're a fool. Well, maybe they are, but who's the bigger fool? The fool or the fool that married the fool? <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyway, I told you this series we would have a little bit of fun. Uh, but please don't do that. I'm not telling you to get a divorce. Uh, somebody say amen. amen. I just want that disclaimer out there. But recognize fools and avoid them to the extent you can. And then when you can't, then be careful that you do not get entangled with them. You see, because ultimately you can't help a fool. You know, you can help normal people. Let me say that again. You can help normal people. You can talk reason with normal people. And by normal, I mean people that are open to hear and listen to things. But if somebody despises knowledge and wisdom and instruction, you can't help them. So the best thing you can do for them is to pray for them. And if you try too hard to help them, you're really probably just going to create a problem. I, I'm not saying you can't, you know, still, you know, like Mr. T, pity the fool. Love the fool. Just don't get too involved with the fool. And, and at that point, realize that the only help for a fool is to turn to God and change their direction in life. And you can't make that happen. You can't. They, they have to, there's a, a different level of them having to open themselves up to that, that they're totally in control of. And that you can't just through conversation change that. That is really a huge matter of prayer at that point, especially if you have some connection that causes you to have concern for the fool. You know, and I'm just using that term because it's fun to use it in one sense. But it is also a biblical term. The fool says there is no God. <laughs> How in the world? I mean, it would be like setting a 747 out in the parking lot. And you go, okay, you got two options. Somebody made it. Or, over billions of years, it just appeared. Makes a little bit more sense somebody made it. You can't look at this world and go, oh, over billions of years, all this intricateness and, I mean, just all the things about the human body, it all just developed by chance. Even if you don't believe in our God, it does not make any sense to not believe in intelligent design. And, uh, and at that point, but the fool says, there is no God. They don't want to hear it because they despise instruction. They really want some, and they don't want consequences for their actions.